Mike. <laughs> Mike, hi, Mike, there you are. I was looking up in the sky. <laughs> oh, it's good to be with you this morning. How do I look, honey? I didn't even check with it. Tie straight? <laughs> she gives me signs every once in a while <laughs> if my tie's crooked, she go. So I'll try to do this and you won't know it. And then my hair's messed up. She does that number. I ain't got much hair, but what little I got, it'll be messed up. And every once in a while, she go. And then I'll go like this. It means I love you too. I'm preaching. Once I get preaching, you'll see that. I'm moving all the place. And I'll go two because I saw her do that. And then she'll go four. And I'll go six. You just think I'm making. <laughs> you don't have a clue what's going on between that woman and I. Oh, boy. It's good to be with you. And I see. We're... Brian, you took off on me. What time is this one done? The first one went by fast, and people, I don't know what happened. It seemed like it went by fast to me. It always goes by fast to me. Good morning. It is good to be with you. <laughs> Got to read my notes here. I'm going to give you this, this morning session. I'm preaching a different message each service. First one I preach one, then I'm preaching a different one now, I'm preaching a different one the next one. And then tonight we start... Because they're introductory sermons to uh, the embracing the transforming power of God's word. And to embrace it. It says, old Abraham, he could see him afar off and he was persuaded of these promises God made to him until finally he embraced them. Once he made them his, he confessed that he was a stranger and a pilgrim. On the, how do you know that's what God's word will do to you? It'll make you a stranger here. How do you know that Christians, this ain't our home? Come on. I'll tell you what, if you say amen, I knock five minutes off the sermon, Okay. Just help me preach this, because we've got a lot to cover this. Anyway, I'm, I'm doing a book project right now. Um, I do things in, I'm project-oriented, so I do things in sevens. So I had seven years of faithful men, and I had seven years of someone I'm preaching. Now I'm in the middle of a pro In fact, I've just completed a, a rough draft of my fourth book, and it's being edited right now, and I'll be getting a hold of a guy this Thursday, and we're going to work on some of the things and see how things are going a fourth book. So I've, I've got three books written, and, and these are introductory because of the series I will be doing starting tonight will be in By the Word of God. This is book three. Th these messages will come from this book, basically. And it's nothing new. In fact, uh, the reason I'm writing books is I'm writing them for our grandchildren. I want to leave a legacy of faith for our children and grandchildren. What did old grandpa believe? And if I live long enough and to see great-grandchildren, which is possible if God gives you enough time, but eventually, how do you know your generations, you will not be here when they're... Are you following that? In other words, uh, there's, uh, there's seed in the loin of our children, grandchildren, and stuff that I will not live long enough to see, but I want to leave a legacy of them. This is what I believe life was about. And from the script, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. That kind of stuff. From the word of God, what is life really about? So I wrote it in the first book was that you must be born again. It's just the gospel. It's, it has in there imputed righteousness. We had a, a grandson just baptized a week ago or two. We missed it. We were hoping we could be there, and they had a snowstorm on the one Sunday night because I'd ask a church to have a service right after the morning service and have like a meal and then a service so I could go to his baptism. And we had a blizzard, and they canceled it, so the next week we couldn't. But his testimony, he wrote his testimony out. I got... There are deacons and elders and churches couldn't write a better gospel testimony than that boy read. I was, just, I was just so blessed. He talked of imputed righteousness and justification by faith. He understood at 14. How many of you know you don't have to be old to figure this out? Would you agree with that? You don't have to be. Grab a hold of God. The younger, the better, man. And anyway, he understands the gospel. And we have grandchildren now that are understanding and embracing the truth of the gospel. Well, let me see I'm writing them all with five-word titles. They're all scriptures. First book, Ye Must Be Born Again. How do you know who said that? Oh, I've got to change my whole sermon. How do you know who said that? How about Jesus, okay? Yeah. Jesus said to Nicodemus, he had religion, he just didn't have a relationship with God. You must be born again. In this next book that I'll be preaching to you out of or from the, the, is Lord teach, Lord, teach Us to Pray. The disciples came, Luke chapter 11, verse 1. And after Jesus had ceased praying, one of, one of his disciples, we don't know who he was, might have been Peter, might not, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. It's not that they didn't know how to pray, they just didn't do it. They're Orthodox Jews. They got prayer books, psalms, rabbinical prayers. From little kids in the synagogue, they've been taught how to pray, they just didn't do it. How have you been willing to admit there are rare occasions, but you, just, you know how to pray and you should pray, you just don't do it. Since you don't answer... 
That's guilty. You know, we're just guilty of this. And, and so that's why this book was written, because it took me 10 years to learn to pray. I knew how to pray. I just didn't do it. I'd start out praying, oh, dear Heavenly Father, I pray for so-and-so. And then I'd stop praying and start thinking. And I'd think about somebody that knew him and somebody that was a mechanic that knew him that fixed my lawnmower, and I got to mow the lawn. After that, I washed the car, and I spent 15 minutes daydreaming. Anybody? <laughs> I had to learn to pray. It was a discipline to learn to do it. Now it becomes a delight to me. Like so many things in the Christian life, we think, oh, Jesus came in, everything is going to come easy. No, it doesn't. Prayer is labor, according to the Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, salute you, a servant of Christ, always laboring fervently for you in prayer, that you might stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Prayers, prayer can be work. Just praying, interceding, intercessions and supplications and giving of thanks be made for all men. That kind of stuff. It's just hard to learn to do that. But now it's a part. Now my wife took to prayer quick. When she got saved, she just took to prayer. <laughs> Having me for her husband probably helped. Oh, God, help this lunatic I'm married to, okay? But she learned to pray, and I learned the scripture memory came easier for me. How many of you know that we're all different, and some things come easier for the Christian than other things? Would you agree? Some things do. And so it's part and part. So the things that come easy, thank God and grab hold of them. The things that come tough, just don't be weary and well-doing. For in due season, you'll reap if you faint. No, it's those kinds of things. It's, it's the whole mindset we have to take. Let me see where I'm at. Um... Oh, there's a chapter in here called Watch and Pray. I'm not going to preach that this morning, but boy, that's a good one. Remember when the disciples were sleeping? Jesus came back, woke them up and said, Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, not watch or pray. Watch and pray. You know what most of us do? We either do watch or pray. Watch means you do something. You raise your kids right, but you never pray for them. Or you pray for your kids and don't do what you're supposed to do to raise them right. Or you pray for people to come to church, but you never invite them. Or you invite them, but you never pray that they would. Are you getting this or all? We do one or the other. We're supposed to do both. Do what you know to do is right and then pray about it. Ask God Almighty to have mercy on you, give you grace and those kind of things to do the things that you cannot do because prayer is taking out of your hands what you can't do, putting into God's hands what, you, what only he can do. It's that relationship we develop with God. Watch and pray. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. No panic. For the true believer, there's a, the panic has to be removed from your vocabulary. When something fearful comes on you, you pray. Be anxious for nothing but everything by prayer and supplication. In all your ways, acknowledge him. How have you wished in just some of your ways you'd remember to acknowledge him? But he says, in all your ways, acknowledge him. And he said, I'll, I'll direct you. I'll, I'll do what only I can do if you'll just acknowledge me. Acknowledge means when you pray. You're calling God in prayer. Well, I'm going to talk to you about three prayers real quickly this morning that every Christian should pray. Just three prayers. And by the way, the two secrets to one hour is one of the chapters in here. Two secrets to one hour. One of the secrets is learn some prayers. Now, I don't know what your background is, or you grew up and everything, but I basically look, you, don't, you don't just quote prayers. There's dangers to that. There's great wisdom. There. How many of you ever have the Valley of Vision or some of the prayer books of the saints and the old? There's some great prayers. And to learn, there's scriptural prayers. Just memorize some prayers in scripture and pray those. They're powerful prayers. The reason so many Christians today do not move into that hour of prayer day is they don't know what to pray. Well, the scripture gives us what to pray. One of the secrets to spending an hour, could you not watch with me one hour? That sounds like that's something meritorious. Can I tell you something? That should be the norm for every Christian. We should be heading in that direction. I want to spend an hour. Your best hour of that day would be the hour you spend with the Lord in prayer. It's the best hour. It's a delight for me. It took time. It took 10 years to learn where I could even head in that direction. I look at it now and I say that the cost is small beside the treasure. All of our kids ought to be in a mental institution having me for their dad. Pastor, evangelists, missionaries. We got kids that know and love God. And Joyce and I credit God and his mercy hearing and answering our prayers. We did the best we could. People, do the best you can. Commit things to God in prayer. Let him do with you what best pleases him. Did you follow that? Let God do with you. Do the best you can. I, you know that I can't do as good as you can, and you can't do as good as I can, but we can do the best that we can. How many of you followed that? See, do that, and then commit it to God in prayer. Is this too intense? Uh, too bad. Here we go. <laughs> this is too important. Prayer is too important. Would you agree with that? It's too, this, is, this is too big of a subject. Now, the three books, let me make a mention on them. Uh, he must be born again, five words, Scripture. Lord, teach us to pray, five words, scripture, by the word of God. That's the one we're going to take off into tonight and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday night, Lord willing. 
By the word of God comes from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, being born again, not of corrupt seed, but of corrupt, by the, word of, by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you, the word of God. When you embrace the word of God and make it yours, your life cannot stay the same. Because the book, the word of God, will not change. Therefore, we have to. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. What is that? Good and acceptable. How are you going to find out the will of God apart from the word of God? You can't. You cannot know the will of God for your life apart from the word of God. It's not something that just the preachers or the people in full-time ministry get. It's for everybody who names the name of Christ. His word, the living word of God that transforms us. Now, three prayers that every Christian should learn and pray these prayers daily. You ought to pray these prayers daily. They, they, they have a powerful effect upon your life. Prayer number one is found in James chapter 1, verse 5. Now, you don't need to turn to it because we're going to be flying over the scriptures, okay? And that's okay. It says this, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and abradeth not. How many of you have ever heard that verse before? If any man, how many of you be willing to admit on one or two rare occasions you've lacked wisdom? Now I never have, but maybe some of you have struggled with this. How about on a daily basis we need wisdom? Somebody say amen and I'll move on. <laughs> well, he, see, I found four ways in scriptures you can get wisdom. This is only one of them. One of the ways is learn the fear of the Lord, Psalms 111, verse 10. Um, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, you've got to understand what wisdom is. Knowledge is accumulating the information. Understanding is understanding how the information, the data, the, the information, and we live in an information age, how this stuff works together. Wisdom is knowing what to do with the knowledge and understanding. A lot of times we know what it is, and, and we see, we understand, we get to accumulate the information, but we don't know how, how does this work out. That's wisdom. That comes from God. And you can learn it by learning the fear of the Lord because man is not born with an inherent fear of God. The Bible says very clearly in the Old Testament and in the New that there is no fear of God before our eyes. We have to, as Isaiah and David said, come let me teach you the fear of the Lord. The reverence, that's what that, that word means, is to reverence God, how that would keep us from evil if we would just realize that I have to stand before a holy, just God someday and give an account of my life. He said that's a, that's a reverence, and you have to learn that. And then there's another way is just get honest with yourself and with God. Psalm 51, David, and Hathi, he is, his psalm of repentance, God says to him, I... You know what I desire from you? I desire truth in the inward parts. And if you will get truth in the inward parts, you'll get real, I will make you to know wisdom. People, we lie to ourselves about our relationship with God. We say things are all right, and when we know they're not, and we say it long enough to preach and we believe it, and then we're self-deceived. Man, just flat out get honest with God. I'm a mess. I'm struggling with this, and I've been struggling with this for so long, God, and you know it. Would you please give me wisdom? Did you get honest with me, and I'll make you to know wisdom. That's one of the ways. Third way is, seek it. Solomon wrote the Proverbs and he said, just seek for wisdom in Psalms chapter, Proverbs chapter 2 like you would for hidden treasure, like you would for gold. Seek for wisdom. Get around people that you know have wisdom in certain areas and rub shoulders with them. Glean all you can. Seek for wisdom like you would for hidden treasure. And then the last way is just flat out ask for it. If you lack wisdom, let him ask it of God who gives to all men liberally. Just go to God and say, God, I'm lacking wisdom and I need it. Give me wisdom. Joyce and I have done this throughout our lives at different times, and we've been amazed at the wisdom God gave us. You knew, like you're talking to a teenager or something, or one of our children, and we know they're a mess, and they're lying to us, and there's troubles in their life. And all, God, we don't, please give us wisdom. And then you start talking to them, and within a few minutes, you realize you ain't sharp enough to come up with the stuff you're telling them. <laughs> have you ever had that happen? You know, this must be of God, and <laughs> it changes their life, and you know it is. We've learned that over the process. Of, so we stop and say, God, give us wisdom. Just give us wisdom. But wisdom isn't enough. By the way, let's pray that prayer. Lord, please give me wisdom. Pray it with me. Lord, please give me wisdom. A simple prayer. But another one is, Lord, teach us to pray. Simple prayer. Five words. They don't have to be long prayers. Just prayers. How many of you know God won't answer prayers until you pray them? Aren't you glad you came for that deep theology? <laughs> oh, no, 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 yeah! How you know he knows what we have need of before we ask? Would you agree with that? But he said, just ask me. You have not. Somebody help me. Don't ask. Just don't ask. And you ask and receive not because you ask and miss. Then you got to realize, oh, there's a little more to this. If I'm asking all about me and I'm the center of the universe, what about the glory of God? Woo, he says, I'm hot on that one. Let me help you with that one. Let's get after this because my glory is for your good. And when you get the good, I get the glory because God produces it. And I, it's in the process of learning this. 
Wisdom isn't enough. Remember when Solomon said, God said, well, what can I do for you? Solomon said, give me an understanding, a wise and understanding heart that I may know how to rule your people. And God said, that's a good request. I'm going to give her to you. And because you didn't ask for wealth and all the other kind of things, he said, I'm going to give you that too. And he had wisdom. <laughs> people used to travel a thousand plus miles, Queen of Sheba, South Africa, up to Israel to hear him say a one-sentence proverb. Now, this man had wisdom. But wisdom isn't enough. You look at the life of Solomon, he died a babbling old fool worshiping idols in the temples of his foreign wives, comma, and God was not pleased with him. You want to find out what can happen to you when you only have wisdom alone? Read Ecclesiastes. They are the pessimistic words of a cynical old man who's drifted far away from God. And that old boy walked with God at one time. You ever read his prayer at the dedication of the temple? When the glory of God came down and the glory made the priests run out in the courtyard and get out and lay on their faces? The heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I... Will God really dwell upon earth with men? And you look at the things that he prayed. That man walked with God in the middle of his life. And when he got toward... One of my goals is to finish well. If you think getting... Yeah, there's enough of you here. How you know getting old ain't for sissies? How about that one, Okay. It just ain't for sissies. You think, oh, you get old, you can live off yesterday's grace. That's the greatest danger you can do. There's a prayer. The old Solomon, at the end of his life, you know what he said? He put on the glasses that looked at life without God, and he said, it's all vanity and vexation of spirit. He said, it's insane without God. Here's how I'm looking at life. And he, how do you know the 700 wives and 300 concubines is not wisdom? Please say amen. amen. That's dumb as a stick. That's in Luke 48, dumb as a stick. I'm sure it's in there somewhere. <laughs> That's just insane, people. You look at our lives, we accumulate things for here to the neglect of there. I got news for you. Wisdom is not enough. You need another prayer. Here's a prayer in Hebrews 4.16. It's a good prayer. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy to find grace to help in time of need. Lord, please give me grace. Lord, please give me wisdom. Lord, please give me grace. You know what grace is? It's the divine enabling power of God for us to do what he reveals we should do. In other words, it's not just knowing. How many of you be willing to admit that there have been times in your life you have known right from wrong, but you didn't have the power to choose right? None of you. Okay, we'll move on to the next point. <laughs> All of us have. We fail. We say, I know this is wrong. And I know what's right, but I just don't seem. And we do that. We knowingly do the wrong. I've done that. I've, I've known what's wrong. And I've still done it. God didn't have the power. See, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, with all sufficiency in all things, might abound unto every good work. Next time you find yourself between two, right and wrong, you have the wisdom God has revealed to you, you know, right, you know what you should do, and you say, I, I can't do it, I'm going to You stop and pray a prayer, God, please give me grace. Oh, God, give me grace. And i got news for you. To fall from the grace, to resist the grace of God is a dangerous thing because he will enable you with the power to do right. He will absolutely give you the power. You still have a will. How do you know God never does this? Would you agree? I'm going to force you to do No more than the devil can force you to do wrong. Would you agree with that? He tempts us, but he can't force us. That power of our will, God gives us the liberty to make whatever choices we want to make, but he doesn't give us the liberty to choose the consequences. We live with the consequences of our choices. Make right choices. I know I should, but I don't always make right choices, and I've known. God, please give me grace. Paul, uh, Paul said it this way, 1 Corinthians 15, 10. For by the grace of God, I am what I am. You want to measure up your life? It's by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was given to me was not in vain. That means God can give you divine enabling power to do right. And you, vain means it appears to have value, but in reality has none. When you resist the grace of God, and you go your own way, can I tell you something? That's vain. So it's possible to have God's grace given to you and still be in vain. But he says, but his grace which was given to me was not in vain, for I labored more abundantly than they all. <gasps> That's the Greek word. It's a D in there. It goes, <gasps> yet not I, but the grace of God. Paul realized that everything in his life that was good came because of the grace of God. How do you know you can't get saved without grace? Would you agree? Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for we're saved by and through faith and that not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. This gift, God said, here it is. Here, I've given it to you. Just ask me for your grace. If you fail, that's why you ask God for mercy. When you, when you sin, you blow it, God have mercy on me. Don't say, oh, God, forgive my sins. No, God have mercy on me. 
The picture of God's mercy is what he did in justice at the cross of his son, Jesus Christ. So he could give to us mercy, the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse us from sin. Now he says, now ask me for grace to help you in this time of need. You need my grace right now. I want you. I never created you to be independent from me, but totally dependent upon me. Here's my grace. Don't resist it. Don't, don't fail of the grace of God. Paul told Timothy, be strong in the grace of all the things he told him for leadership to rule and set in order the things in the churches of Asia, the ones that are referred to in the book of Revelations. He said, now be strong in grace. Oh, be strong in grace. James 4, 6 says he giveth more grace. James 1, ask for grace. He said, I'll give her to you. I give more. God, I need more grace. I'll give you more. He giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resists the pride, but God gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you. It's all saturated with grace. Let's say you ask God for wisdom, and you ask God for grace. This next step is scary. I've known people that have had the wisdom of God upon their life and the grace of God upon their life. See, in the ministry, I'm rubbing shoulders with pastors and missionaries and evangelists, and Christian workers, elders, deacons, who at one time were living for the Lord, walking in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Had God's, they, they were focused, and they were serving the Lord. I, I'm talking about guys I have preached circles around me had better theology and knew more scriptures, that today whose lives are an absolute mess, they're shelved. That concerns me. I want to finish well. There's a lot of guys that don't. I talked to a guy, interpreted the entire New Testament through, missionary 25 years, whose life now is an absolute mess, who told me just within the last month, I don't believe that stuff anymore, Tom. How could you, how have you be willing to admit that you probably never will translate the New Testament into a tribal language? How you, I probably won't do that, okay. How do you think he had to do some serious study to handle the word of God accurately? Can I tell you something? He probably knows more about, he's forgot more about God than most of us will ever know. Something happened. What happened? I can tell you his Achilles heel, his chink in his armor, where it's at in his theology, it's in the third prayer. If you ask God for wisdom and he gives it to you, what should I do with my life? And he begins to direct it. God, give me grace. I know I need to walk through this door. I, I, I know, dear God, I need to close this one. I need to buy and sell. I need to put off and put on. I need to submit and resist. And you get into the Christian life because it's, it's not just one or the other. It is both. You're leaving something and you're going to such a city. And you can't go to the place where God wants you until you leave the place you're at. And in the journey of faith, see, I look over my shoulder and see the changes God has brought in my life. And I, I believe that I'm walking in the Spirit right now. I believe these are the very messages God would have me preach to prepare us to hear the Word of God about embracing His transforming power. And you grow along in your journey of faith. Could I be a statistic? Can I tell you something I could? You could hear about Tom Harmon making a mess of his life. Missionary left his wife, started living with another woman, married her eventually. His son told him he was gay. His daughter don't want him to come to his wedding. It's an absolute mess. And I would to God, there was only one isolated incident that I knew about, that I know more about than in this room. You see, a man's got God's wisdom. A man's got God's grace. Or a woman's got God's grace. There's one more prayer you need. It's the prayer that Jesus prayed the most. It's the prayer that few Christians pray. It's the prayer that we have in Bible, in the Bible, that Jesus pray. It's the prayer I. I won't just pray this prayer alone in my morning prayer. I pray this prayer throughout the day. It's found in John seventeen fifteen. Jesus is. This is his prayer for his disciples. He's getting ready to be crucified and head off to glory. He said, "Oh Father, I pray." that you take them not out of the world. He's praying for his disciples now. He said, I'm not praying for the world yet, and I'm not praying about me right now. I'm praying for the disciples. I pray not that you take them out of the world. How do you know that when you're out of this world, and if you're born again and in the presence of heaven, you're beyond the devil's reach? Now, would you agree with that? You don't have to worry about that. But here's the prayer that he prays. He says, Father, I pray that you don't take them out of the world. Leave them right in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, shining his lights. He said, don't take them out of the world. Just keep them from, now my old KJ says evil. The Greek word is poneros. 
And it, you put an also on a Greek word and it puts a personage to it. It's the same one that's neglected in the other prayers. Keep him from the evil one. Keep him from the wicked one. The devil, a real devil. There is a real devil, people. I don't care how we've tried to Halloween character him and put him in some kind of a harmless category. There is a real Satan who is a spirit that works in the sons of disobedience. He is the enemy of God. He is the hater of everything that God loves. He is the hater of you if you are born again. There's a real enemy. He's, in fact, he said in Luke 22, 21, just before the cross, he says to Simon, he said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have... Shouldn't we learn something from this? Jesus, God Almighty, the Word of God incarnate, gives an illustration, says, he wants to have you, but I've prayed for you. I've prayed for you. What did he pray? One thing, that your faith won't fail. Can your faith fail? How many of you ever had your faith fail you on, on occasion? Man, I have. It's like blowing a tire. None of you, huh? Okay. Man, just to have an absolute blowout in my faith. Just fail me. It ain't doing what it's supposed to be doing. He said, I'm praying your faith won't fail. How many of you know when Peter shut his mouth off and said to Jesus, he said, hey, all the rest of these guys may forsake you. I got out of that boat, remember that night? I walked on Galilee with you and I, I know who you are. And I will never deny. He said, you deny me three times before the rooster crows. He said, Jesus, you ain't wrong very often, but you blew. You know what he does? He rebukes the Lord. He says to him, I will die. I'll go to prison, but I will never deny you. <laughs> Have you ever heard the old rooster crow in your life before? Well, I'll never do that. <laughs> Aren't you glad you came for this deep theology? <laughs> The old rooster crowed on him, and he went out, and for 72 hours, the, door, the devil tormented him. He'll never forgive you now, not after that. Now, the last time you cursed, you took his name in vain. He'll never forgive you. Then he just tormented him. He didn't say that he wouldn't have any troubles in his faith. He just prayed that his faith wouldn't fail. Because he knew the shield of faith would quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. But pretty soon you see old Peter going back to Galilee where Jesus was at. Pray, pray against the enemy. You say, where's the other prayers recorded for us? How about in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those. Now here's the one. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from, mine says evil. You know what the Greek word is? Paneros. Deliver us from the evil. If you have an NIV, NAS, it'll put evil one in there. And that's what should be in there. He says, you know what those prayers were? That's, that's what he answered in Luke chapter. The Lord teaches to pray. He gave him a prayer. And that was the prayer he gave him. It was a prayer that he taught on when he was teaching out of the, the Sermon on the Mount, getting the people around. He'd teach them on prayer. He said, here's a prayer. You want a prayer? You want to learn how to pray? Here's a prayer. Here's a good one. Put this one in your prayer book. Learn this prayer. God, keep me from the evil one. People, we're in a battle, and it's not just flesh and blood. Ephesians 6, 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle. Come on, somebody say amen. How many of you know there is a spiritual battle going on? The devil would love to have your scalp hanging from his belt, along with every one of your children, your marriages, this church. He'd love it, and he is opposed to it. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you might be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about you with truth. Word of God. You know... The book that I just wrote, the title of it is For Me and My House. It's the book I wanted to write. More than these other books, that's the book I wanted to write. I want to keep them all under 100 pages. I've been able to do that. This one's over 100 pages. I've got to edit. Joyce said, oh, don't edit some out of it. No, I want to keep them all. They're readable. These are little books that are not threatening. 85, 75, 80 some. They're, small. They're not threatening. You can read these books real easy. By the way, if you want to... <laughs> If you want to read a book that's going to dazzle your theology or wow you with some new insight, don't get these. This is meat and potato stuff for just practical how you slug it out in the journey of faith. This is the gospel. This is, this is prayer. These are all essentials for the Christian life. Just the basics. No, no deep, ooh, ooh, I didn't know about that. The real, the one I wanted to write was for me and my house. Because right there is my ministry, is my wife. And our children and our grandchildren. You're a byproduct. If it's first piety at home, you have a ministry. I'm not going to stand up and tell people about the power of Christ to change your life, and he's not changing mine. 
Because I can come here on a Sunday morning and preach you a hot sermon. It could be all a lie and fake. There's one person who knows it's not. My wife. See, I can tell you whatever I want to tell you up here. And I, by the way, I give you my best side. How many of you know she sees the other one? <laughs> she knows if God's at work in my life or not. So do my children. Our grandchildren want a relationship with them. Book five is the one she wants me to write, which I'm getting, getting ready to take off on. One book a year. You know what the title of it is? The Weapons of Our Warfare. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Most Christians don't have a clue more than two weapons. I found 22 weapons in this book on how to fight the good fight of faith. How to put on my armor. It's become a part. Joyce said there's no one theological issue other than the gospel that has changed our life, our marriage, and our children, and our ministry more than understanding the unseen enemy of our soul. See, people, we should not allow him to take advantage of us. It says, for, Paul said, for we're not ignorant of his devices. Most American Christians are absolutely ignorant of Satan's devices. They don't know where the darts are coming from. They don't understand that not every thought we have is our own. And what do I do when I understand this is straight out of the pit of hell? This didn't come from God, and it certainly it didn't come from me, and it certainly didn't come from God. How do you stand? What do you do? How do you take back ground? How do you put your life under the Lordship of Christ? How do you take the weapons and use them? How do you do that? That's another one that's going to be hard to keep under 100 pages. Changing our lives. The devil for I don't know how long told me she was the problem and told her I was the problem. How many of you know you realize you're not the problem, but you do have an enemy? You can isolate that, deal with the sin issues, and you can come into victory. Life-changing stuff. We've walked in victory in this for 20 years now. It's been proven. My Bible says, prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. Well, I don't know how many of these to give you. I'll give you one more, and then we're going to go to closing. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, 10, 2. Be sober, be vigilant for, if you know it, your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Okay, let's say you've got this guy. This walking in the wisdom of God. I mean, the, the, wisdom is knowing what to do, okay? You get it down, okay, this is what I do with this. I got the information, got the understanding. This is what I do with it. How many of you know it shouldn't be a debate every Sunday on whether or not you're going to come to church? That's a no-brainer. I even know just being here, you have built-in accountability, and you get some fellowship, you sing a song that you may not have sung all week long, you hear prayers, you hear preaching. This is a no-brainer. We need this. Would you agree? How do you know God knew what he was doing when he designed the church? If you don't say amen, you ain't getting out of here. <laughs> Would you agree that the church is something Christ himself said, I will build this. I'm doing this, and the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. This is no-brainer. So just wisdom. You start doing those kind of things. Let me give you this illustration. There's a guy by the name of Jabez, okay? First Chronicles 4, 9, 10, nobleman. Same thing, basically Solomon, okay? Same kind of deal. And what can I do for you? He says, well, I want you to bless everything and put my hand to it. I want the Midas touch if I can interpret that. I want you to bless what I have. If I'm working in the field, bless my crops. If I'm working in business, bless my business. I just want you to bless everything and put my hand to it. He said, I want you to expand my borders. I want to be known that your hand is upon me. Okay, he wants to, I want to be, I've never prayed that part of that prayer. The first two parts I prayed. The second part, that middle part, I never prayed, God expand my borders. The third part, he says, and God keep me from evil, comma, and God granted his request. Solomon asked for wisdom. He dies a babbling old fool. This guy prays, bless my hands, man. All the things you think he shouldn't have prayed. But he tacked on the end where he said, and God keep me from evil, and God Granted his, you know what? He finished well. I want to finish well. I want to, you know what my goal is for this decade of my life? If I get this decade of my life, I've got a goal. I choose one goal every year. Maybe I'll even share something. I don't know if it's in any of the sermons I'll be preaching. The goal that I have for this year, but my goal for this decade, I'm in my 60s, okay? You know what my goal is? To become a sweet old man. <laughs> How many of you know I'm doing well on the old part? Somebody say Amen. <laughs> It's that sweet stuff I have troubles with every once in a while. See, I got grandchildren. I want to remember you as a sweet old man. I remember my grandparents. They were sweet old people. How do you know you can be a bitter, grouchy, impatient, sarcastic old person? Did you know that? 
Just getting old don't mean you get sweet. If you don't say amen, I've known some. I don't want to be one. And I have all the potential to be one of them. I don't want to be one of them. And so God is this year in his goodness and grace. <laughs> Come back. I can't type it. This ain't a sermon. Keep me from evil. Let me ask you this. Without, without going through all this stuff, how many of you would be willing to say, my prayer life needs prayer? Anybody? Okay. Mine does too. I still need to, I still need to move into this. This stuff is, <laughs> how many of you know this stuff is easier to preach than it is to live? <laughs> Nonetheless, where else will I go? What's the most important prayer a person can ever pray? I'll close with this. What's the most important prayer a person can ever pray? I take heat over this. People criticize me over this. And there's a big movement today against the sinner's prayer. <laughs> Knock yourself out. I can't live with your theology and you can't live with mine. I found a verse in the Bible where there's two guys who went to the temple to pray. They both went to pray. The one guy has got more religion than all of us. You could grind this whole group up and sort through the best parts. You couldn't make this Pharisee. I mean, he has got religion. He stands and prays thus with himself. Oh, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men are. Any of you see a problem with that part? We're all in the same kettle of fish. We're all made of the same cookie dough. Dough, do. Maybe, maybe cookie dough, too, okay? We all, we all have the sin in us. But he doesn't have it. I tithe, I fast, I do this, and I'm not like this tax, this publican over here. And the other old publican, he knew he was a sinner. See, those guys, most of them were thieves. Rome said, we need this much money from you in that particular area. Anything you make over that, it's yours. You know what they did? They just doubled the taxes. Gave Rome what they wanted, just as long as he kept them happy. And they were thieves. They'd set up tax booths. They had Roman soldiers to work and all the muscle they had. And with affluence, so many times comes temptation. First Timothy 6 is right. But they, will, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Zacchaeus, remember that little guy climbing the sea, saw Jesus go by? And he went to his house and he says, I will give back half of what I've taken. These guys are thieves. And they also lived that lifestyle. They took the money illegally, so they spend it, and they spend it on vice, immorality, and drunk, drunk. And they were just they were wicked. They'd been given over to the... Well, he comes to the temple. He's had enough of it. By the way, can I tell you something? Some of the most miserable people in the world are the extremely wealthy that are as empty as a 55-gallon drum. They've, like Solomon, they've had everything the world affords them, and it's still never satisfied. It's still never met the need of their soul. Would you agree with this now? Now, here, here. This guy is under conviction of God. He's as empty as can be. He said, I'm going to church and I'm going to pray. You may, you may be here this morning like this. He prayed a one-sentence prayer. He wouldn't even lift his eyes to heaven, so that means he's humble. He doesn't tell anything about himself. He already knows God knows. He said, oh, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Come up. Jesus said, and that man went back to his house justified. You want to study what justification is? The same word diakuth that applies to the sinner who gets saved and gets the righteousness of God imputed to their life. A simple, the most important prayer you can ever pray if you're under conviction of your lostness is, oh God, have mercy on me and save my soul. Because he's the only one who can and he's the only one who will. When he comes in, can I tell you something? He'll bring his desires, his will for your life and you will be a new creation. Say amen. You'll be a new person. That's the most important prayer you can have. And then after that, man, there's all kinds of prayers you can pray. Just the journey of faith. Man, pray in everything by prayer. Pray about everything. Worry about nothing. Be thankful for anything. Just pray. I pray if that's your condition this morning, you'd cry out to God to have mercy on you and save you. The next service I'm going to be speaking on, introduction to this book. I say this about these books. I don't sell them. We'll put them on the back table starting tonight. I just don't like to do it on Sunday morning. There are times that places say, oh, no, I just don't care to. And it's about that money-changing stuff. <laughs> I stay into that, okay. But they cost me $7 a piece to print them. They're self-published. And there'll be a bag back there tonight, and there'll be books on that table. And if you want a book, and you can help me with the printing costs, fine. You can throw something in that bag. If you want a book and can't help me with printing costs, take a book and welcome. And I do this every place I go. If you buy them off my wedge page, it's different because our daughter-in-law does this. Two dollars shipping and go to the post, all that kind of baloney. But they'll be in the back tonight. The gospel in its simplest form. 
simple things I've learned the last 20 years about prayer. The Word of God. That's what we're going to take a look off, take a look at tonight, begin to examine tonight and this morning. Just one, the message I will preach in the next service will not be in this book. Everything else will be. Well, I think a better prayer. My time's up. Thank you for listening. <laughs> you helped me get done on time. Heavenly Father, help us, help us, help us. As Peter once said, we don't know where else to go. You alone have the words of eternal life. Brand them upon us, God. Leave marks upon our soul with regard, with regard to the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. With regard to our privilege to have access to you, the Almighty, through prayer because of grace. And then, God, would you in your goodness give us a hunger, a thirst for your word, for the righteousness that's in it that transforms our life. It begins to change the way we think, and God, the way we behave is because of the way we think. May we begin to think your thoughts. May our lives begin to be transformed. Bless us, God, I pray in Jesus' precious, holy name.